This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I want to speak to you about Christ's call to repentance. I'm going to read to you a scripture from Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 5. Luke 13. If you don't have your Bible, just listen to the story. There were present at that time some that told Jesus of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you suppose that the Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered so many things? I tell you, no. Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. For those 18 upon whom the tire of Siloam fell and slew them, do you think they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But except you repent, he shall all likewise perish. Now, Jesus, make this message simple. Help me to make it simple and understandable. And Holy Spirit, come and make these words real to me while I speak them and to every hearer. In this place, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I I warned our mailing list with thousands of people receive our mail, our messages, and I warned them that probably 60 days would be as long as we would truly remember the tsunami, that these things happen so frequently. Nature appears to be out of control. At least that's what many are saying. And so quickly we forget But it's been a time to weep this past year. The floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, incredible weather changes, and all the media, television, radio, newspapers, magazines. And if you have watched these scenes, if you've seen them, newspapers and magazines and heard of them, you had to weep when little children are swept away when loved ones are torn from their very arms, and when you see all of these tragedies that are happening, even now in Florida, the damage done by those hurricanes has not been wholly repaired, and you still whole areas that are blotted out, that are blotched. And one newspaper said, uh, someone's tinkering with nature. Somebody... Somewhere, and, and one newspaper reporter, and, and this was one of the a minor headline. It says, "Is something happening now that has to do with God?" In other words, does God have anything to do with what's happening in the world today? All of these drastic weather changes. Is God involved? And the question is being asked even by secularists and even by atheists. Some atheists have come to the conclusion this is something beyond human nature or natural disaster because been, this tsunami was called the world's worst uh, natural disaster, the world's worst or one of the worst. And they, we don't know what's going to happen next, but there's a cry in our hearts you know, when 9-11 hit this city, uh, we were down there. This church was one of the first to go. We had a tent, if you recall, right down there. The first church that was called by the mayor's office. We were down there. And our workers worked with the situation down there. This church, we gave over half a million dollars to the police and to the, the firemen's association. This church wept and we prayed for the people. And you see what Jesus has said in this Galilee. He said, do you think the Galileans were, were worse? You see, the Galileans were people, a, a Jewish group who were worshiping the Lord and they were sacrificing their animals. They were actually in an act of worship. And Pilate and his army came in and slew 
uh, uh, quite a group of these Galileans while they're worshiping. And they mixed the blood, their own blood with the sacrifices. And they came to Jesus in this story that I just read to you. And they said, Lord, uh, were those Galileans unusual sinners? Is that why they died like that? In other words, the tsunami, the earthquakes, 9-11, all these things, all of those people who died, were they sinners? Were they being judged? Were, were you doing this to them? One Muslim cleric from the Mideast said, this was our God, this was Allah. And I'm quoting him almost word for word, remembering what he said. He said, these Muslims who died in this were special sinners that God had to, our God had to erase, had to remove. Jesus, perceiving their question where they were going with it, are these more sinners? Were they more wicked? And is that why they were destroyed and died in the fashion they died? And Jesus said, well, what about the Tower of Siloam? There was a pole called the Pole of Siloam where uh, crippled people and people who couldn't walk would get into the water when it was stirring. The first one in, uh, we were told, were healed. And near that was a tower. And we don't know. The Bible doesn't say how it fell. But it fell. It, 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 you know, we, our towers fell. But I don't know how these, this tower failed. And 18 people were killed. And that was fresh. It had evidently just happened. And it was very fresh in the minds of the people. And Jesus said, well, what about the people who were killed during the fall of the Tower of Siloam. Do you think that they were special sinners? Do you think that's why they died? And Jesus said, no. He, he said, beware. He said, don't think that way. He said, think about yourself. He says, unless you repent. Unless you repent. God said, you deal with yourself. I remember what it was like to go down there in the midst of that, that fire and that smoke. And see people walk around in a daze, especially those who were, who were hauling out the dead and the wounded. And I stood there weeping and said, oh, God, my God, you have to be saying something. That this can't just be something of nature. We don't think that they were sinners. Some of the godliest people in this city died in 9-11 here. You see, God didn't do it, but God allowed it. He could have stopped it at any point. But you see, in all of these national calamities, the calamity that happened, you, some people say, well, isn't God in control? Especially to Job, God tried to make this clear. He said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? He said, don't you understand that I have reserves, I have places where I store the rain, I, I have places where I hold the frost and the snow and the ice. He said, I even, who do you think put the fear of grasshoppers in a horse? He goes over and over and he says, who do you think is in control? He said, everything is in control of my word. I speak the word and everything that is done on the face of this earth, I know about. And God can stop or God has a reason for all of these things that happen. And God is speaking through them. God is speaking. Now, I have heard people say after I heard ministers preach this from pulpits, heard them on the radio. I've read their reports, and so many thousands of ministers in America said at 9-11, God wasn't saying anything. Right after that, I preached a message from this pulpit. The towers have fallen, and we've missed the message. We have missed the message. All across this country, people were go, went to church, and even in this city. And in, I told this church of a, of a church in the south that deacons came to me. The eldest flew to New York and met me in the back room and said, we were weeping. We were saying, is God speaking? Pastor, we're, we want to know. In some church, they were getting up, interrupting the pastor because he wasn't even referring to it. Preaching. One man was preaching on, on morals and talking about sex in a Christian. And they were getting up and said, Pastor, hold it. We want to know, is this God speaking? Is, is this just a happenstance? Is this just nature? Or is God saying something to us? Is he causing us to wake up? It's causing us to look at ourselves. What, what is the reason? And they said, we had no answer. And so 
Six months after 9-11, fewer people going to church than before 9-11 here in New York City. Is God saying something to us through these things? Yes. But he's speaking not only to the world, but he's speaking to the church of Jesus Christ. He's speaking to us. Don't sit smugly. Don't think for a moment that those who died in Sri Lanka and in Indonesia and all of those countries. Now, of course, there was wickedness. Some people look at what happened. And that's what prompted this Muslim cleric. He was talking about all of the stealing of children. He was talking about pedophiles that were coming from all over the world to those areas and talking about hotels and whole companies that were set up to cater to pedophiles. And they were stealing little orphan children and using them for the pleasure of these men. And they said, God had to wipe that out. In Sodom, the Bible says that God caused fire to fall from heaven. But you see, he also said that when the flood came, he sent rain for 40 days. God said, I sent that. He said, I destroyed all living things. A wrathful God, a mad God who just uh, does it at his pleasure. No, 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 no. A merciful God. God says he waited for 120 years during the preaching of Noah. 120 years God put up with mockery. For 120 years God put up with rejection. With one call of a man who walked the streets. And the word spread everywhere that God is speaking. Judgment is coming. I was in the hospital with my wife last night and they had a television. I was watching Billy Graham. This was one of his last. He's coming here in July for his last crusade. Never heard such a powerful message. He said, judgment's coming. You better get ready. You better repent. He's talking not just to the sinner, but to the Christian as well, to all of us. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. God waited. Folks, what does God have to do to wake up a people? What has to come next? What other weapon does God have in his arsenal? How can he get the attention of men? There has to come finally, as it did to, to, to Egypt, when the children of Israel, were, God said, let my people go. And time and time again, nine times he spoke through natural disasters. And the tenth time God said, that's enough. I'm going to move in a way now that everybody's going to know this is not nature. This is God speaking. And that's when the death angel came to Egypt. And that's when Pharaoh let the people go. Because all of Egypt said, this is God now. This is not nature. I don't know what is coming. But I, I know that we are not to judge. We're not to judge any of this. That's in the hand of God. One thing we are to do. And that's to look at ourselves as Christians, as believers. Now, let me tell you, I don't think that anybody came here this morning expecting to repent. Any Christian. If you were, somebody's been coming to Times Square for any period of time, you came to worship this morning. You came to praise. You didn't come to hear Pastor Dave say you need to repent. I, I, I believe you. I, I believe that you came because you say, I, I'm not living in any open sin. I, I am not drinking. I'm not carousing. I'm, I'm not into any of that. I, I am secure in Christ. Yes, I stand before you totally secure in Jesus Christ. I repented when I gave my heart to Jesus. And so did you. You repented totally of your sins and said, Lord, take all your past sins you laid before the Lord. He said, Jesus, there's a godly fear in me that you have placed. And Christ came into your heart. And when Christ, he said, if you're of Christ, the Spirit dwells in you. And if the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, you're not of Christ. So the Holy Spirit was sent into your heart. Not only to help cover, the blood alone covers your past sins, but the Holy Spirit is given to you for your present and future sins where you're going to produce character. Now, there is one sin that we are all guilty of, 
that we all, who Christians, all of us, are going to have to repent of, and we're going to have to live in that state of repentance. The Bible says, godly sorrow works repentance. That word, root word in Greek, is an occupation. In other words, there's a pledge made when you give your heart, when there's godly sorrow, and you come to Jesus Christ. You're not just saying a little prayer, Jesus, forgive me, I'm sorry for my sins. Uh, I believe on you, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm saved. Well, if you have faith, yes, but that's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning. Because you see, the heart is abundantly wicked. And the Lord saves you. He secures you. He can seat you in the heavenly place. And then he says, now I'm sending the Holy Ghost to work on your character. I'm sending the Holy Ghost. You don't have to worry about going to hell now. You don't have to worry about that. There are things in your life that need to change. And there are things in my life that need to change. And that's where living in repentance comes in. Let me show you the heart of repentance. The very heart of repentance. And God was dealing with me strongly last night on this. Just pouring it into my soul for my own learning. You tell me, yes, you did repent. But God says, I have given you the Holy Spirit. Now listen, if... I, I have preached from this pulpit the last two Sundays about the calling that is all of ours, that we bear fruit only when we desire to be like Christ and we live Christ-like. But you see, there comes a time when you have to pray this. If you truly want to go on with the Lord, and if you don't, you're going to grow cold, you're not going to read your Bible, you're not going to pray, and you're going to backslide. You're going to drift away. But there has to be not just... A prayer, but a cry in your heart that says, Holy Spirit, I want you to show me everything in my life that's unlike Christ. I want you to show me. That's the cry of my heart. I'm praying, Lord, I want to be more like Christ. I want to finish out my days. Not as some, no, I don't think I was mean. But there were things around me that I didn't know about myself that others knew. But I was blind to. Now, you fit that, whether you want to commit it or not. Everybody listening to me right now, there are things about you you don't know. Your wife knows, your husband knows, your children knows. Those are at your job, surely know. <laughs> you see, I want to be like Jesus, but how can I be like Jesus unless I know who he is and, and what he's like? And I can't fully know who he is and who he's like and how I can be like him unless the Holy Spirit exposes to my own heart those things. Now, he doesn't, around, he doesn't go around looking for sin. He doesn't go around trying to expose. God's not into the business of exposing sin. He exposes to your own heart. The only sin he exposes when after it's been revealed to you and you don't want to do anything about it, you harden your heart. And then he says, I have to expose it. It's the only way possible now I may be able to save you. But you see, I want to be like Jesus. So the Holy Spirit has to tell me how to be like Jesus. He has to expose my innermost being. He has to expose it to me. That will never happen until you see. You don't even receive the Holy Spirit until you ask. He said, the Holy Spirit is given to every man who asks. Now, why do you want the Holy Spirit? What do you, why do you think he abides? This body becomes, when you give your heart to Christ, this body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. He becomes our advocate with Christ. Christ is at the right hand of God pleading. He is our advocate. He's our lawyer. But you see, in my heart, the Holy Spirit comes to be Christ's advocate to make me like himself so that I can live a fulfilled life, so that I can have a taste of heaven and live in some heaven here and not hell. And that's why he says to those that he was talking to a religious people when they asked him this question. See, they were looking at everybody else. Are they sinners? Is God dealing? Is God judging with these people that are dying on the left and on the right? And the Lord said to his own disciples, he, I read that to all of those church people, the synagogue people and the religious scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. And he said, no. And he didn't even give them an explanation about why they died. He just said, I want you to stop looking and look at your own heart. 
Have you done that recently? You see, the big sin is pride. Pride. Now, folks, let me tell you the only measure of pride. Pride can't be measured on any relationship with anybody in the world. It has nothing to do with how you relate to the world. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Pride has only to do with your relationship to Jesus Christ. Only that may see the world is is given to pride. That Luciferian pride is the, the sinner is a proud man because you see pride is self dependence. Humility is whole total dependence on Jesus Christ. Wholly dependent on Christ in every area of the life, dependent on the Holy Spirit, which who is the Spirit of Christ. And he's at work. You see, it, it, it comes down, it works like this. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to live like I did. And I know that changes have to be made. I want my wife. I want my husband. I want those I work with to know there's a difference in me. I'm not what I was last year, and I'm changing. Every day I'm changing. And the Holy Spirit will come to you, and I'm going to show you where the pride is. You say, well, pride is arrogance. Well, what is arrogance but saying, I don't need Christ. I can atone for my own sins. I can work out my own salvation. That's arrogance. That's pride, yes. But in the Christian who's saved and secure and even seated with Christ in a heavenly place, there's something the Holy Spirit is trying to get at. And if you, you, you think you know it all in just five years, ten years, no, you see, the moment you give your heart to Jesus, that's when the joy of the Lord should begin. And you have to know that the Lord is with you and the Holy Ghost is here living in His temple. The Holy Ghost is not out somewhere in the cosmos. The Holy Ghost is right there in your heart. He's right here in this place. The presence of the Lord is here, yes, through the Holy Spirit. But I'm 74, coming on 74. And I want you to know I'm still learning my lessons. Still yearning, hungering to be more like Christ. And I want to change. Here's how it works sometimes. And here is, here's the definition of pride as, as the Lord's been showing it to me. The Lord speaks to my heart. Maybe somebody says something to me that shocks me about myself. That happened not too recent, not too long ago where somebody said something that really hit me. And it wasn't said in, in any anger or anything, but the essence of what was said to me is you are a proud man. There's, there's something that you've said that you sound to me like you're boasting. I got an elevator and I wept. I said, oh, God, I don't want that in my life. I didn't see it. The Holy Spirit used this person to, to, to show me, and I said, Holy Spirit, I accept that. Now, here's, here's where pride comes in. It's, well, thank you, Lord. You see, maybe your wife knows that you quarrel too much. You raise your voice at your wife. Maybe you're looking at your life and say, I've mistreated my wife. Or, or the husband is here, or the wife is here and say, I've, I've been too quick tempered with my husband. I've been I've been on his back. Now things are getting very, very quiet. <clears throat> and suddenly you realize that you're quick. You see things that are hurtful. And you say, God, I see it. Okay. Starting right now, I'm changing. Starting right now, I'm going to be sweet. Starting right now, I'm going to be different. And so for the first two or three days, you're sweet. <laughs> there is a bit of a difference. It's all on the surface. But it's all pride. 
Because you see, it's a spirit of deep independence. I can do it myself. I can do this. I can do this. Humility is simple. I can't do anything without Christ, without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. And the Holy Spirit is waiting for me to let him work. And he wants me to ask for a revelation of what's in my heart. When's the last time you ask him, Holy Spirit, show me everything in my life that's unlike Christ. You see, Jesus said to his disciples, there's some things I can't tell you right now because you're not ready. He had to wait till the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, he showed him. And that's why these men were so broken. And that's why they grew so much. They were secure. They were saved. But God was working on them because godly sorrow works. That's an occupation. That, that's a pledge that you make. I'm going all the way with Jesus. It's not having to do with your salvation. It's having to do with how you become a witness, how you become Christ-like. And the only sermon they're going to hear on the job is what they see in you of the Christ life. Does that make sense? <clears throat> you see, we say, we, we, we wound the heart of Jesus. When he sees how you carry your burden, he sees you go all through the day wounded. He, he, he sees the things that you bear. He, he sees you going on week after week or month after month afraid of man and always trying to be accepted. See, that, 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 that's in me. That's been a part of my life. I've, I've always felt I didn't measure up to certain pastors and I don't have the education and, and I'm not like the others. And, and, and see, when, when you don't feel like you're accepted, you, you go out of your way to try to please people. And the fear of man steps in. Now, thank God he's delivered me from most of that. I hope this afternoon he shows me otherwise again. <laughs> we live with self-loathing. We live with fear and depression, anxiety, stress. And we have all the keys. We have everything we know locked here in our heart. All the power that we need to overcome but you see, it's not just asking the Lord. The power of the Holy Spirit is there. And the Lord is wounded when you go on and on. And he says, God says, wait a minute. Jesus says, you're, you're wounding me. You hurt my heart because I died for this. I gave my life and I sent the Holy Spirit. And he abides in you. And you don't take advantage of that. You don't call upon him. In James, the first chapter, it says, if any man lacks wisdom, and this is wisdom is Christ himself. Wisdom equals Christ, the mind of Christ. That's wisdom. And when you pray for wisdom, he said, let a man ask without wavering. No wavering whatsoever. No doubt that when I ask God to give me strength, he'll give me strength. When I ask God to relieve this pressure that's on me, he will relieve it. In the hospital the other day, I was so tired. And I was just the point where I said, God, I can't go another step. I'm so tired. And if you don't give me strength, I'm going to collapse right here. I'm just physically weary. And I said, you see, and here's the only way it's going to work, where you stop suddenly in the middle of your problem, in the middle of your financial problem. In the middle of your fear, in the middle of everything that's going on in your life, you stop, say, God, I'm wholly dependent on you. I can't do this. That's humility. That's what God's been after all along. Trust me. I have given you the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit. We talk about being baptized the Holy Ghost. We talk about speaking with tongues and all of the gifts of the Spirit. But when you come down to where the rubber meets the road, it's simply this. Do you trust the Holy Ghost that He will do what He's promised to do? That He'll be there. Strength will come. And I'll tell you, strength flooded my soul. Gave me strength. 
And within the hour, I felt better than I did in the morning when I woke up. He's going to do that for Pastor Carter, even while we have prayed, because he knows the secret on how to ask. But we ask, and then we drop it. We ask, and then we don't rest in faith. And I said, Lord, I don't want to wound your heart anymore. I said this last week, and I want to repeat it before I close. The greatest cheer that you can bring to the Holy Spirit, and he is a person. His spirit, but he's a person. The Holy Spirit feels, he touches, he breathes. And he's a spirit. But the Lord revealed to me the one thing that makes glad the heart, the very being and essence of the Holy Spirit, is that we hunger for Jesus and his likeness. And when that happens, when he sees your heart and your mind set, I want to be like Christ. I don't want to be mean-spirited. I don't want to be a gossiper. I don't want grudges in my heart. You see, these things block the blessing and the moving of God in our lives. I'm going to tell you, he's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. He wants to give you every power that's available in his majesty this moment to say, I love you. And I know what you're going through. But please. Use me. Use me. Open your heart. The Lord wants to do a healing work in many here this morning. He brought you here for a reason. I don't know who you are, where you're from, or you may be from another country, but the Lord brought you to this church this morning. He set you in this seat. Because he wanted to get a message through to you. No matter how you failed him in the past. No matter how you feel about yourself. That doesn't matter. And humility has nothing to do with going around saying, well, I'm I'm just nobody. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm clean. And that's not humility. It's not even humility to say, I'm bowed before the cross. You see, once you're bowed before the cross, you don't stay there. You have to ascend into the heavens and to be with Christ. You're no longer just groveling. Or There's some people grovel at the cross, at the foot of the cross, and they sing about it and talk about it. Well, I'm at the foot of the cross. You've got to move on to ascension with Christ. Where you, my simple face said, Jesus... I trust you with every problem, every fear, everything in my life. I'm going to depend on you. And when you do, rest comes. Total, complete rest. Folks, I'm going to close with this. This is not hard to do. You say, I've tried it. It's not hard. He just says, open your heart and let me take over. Give me control, complete control of your life. I don't do anything anymore. I don't go anywhere without permission. I'm under the rulership. Christ is enthroned in my heart, and that means he's in control, that I've given up the reins. I've placed my wife, my children, my grandchildren, everybody in his hands. I've placed ministry in his hands. I'm not called anymore to ministry. I'm not called to this church specifically or to evangelism. I'm not called to anything but Jesus and his heart and his likeness. And then if I do, ministry will come. All of these things will pour out of the Christ likeness that is in us. Will you stand, please? Now, people, I've I've just given you a heart-to-heart talk this morning from my heart. I know one thing, the Holy Spirit is present. I know something else. I know something about you and everyone that's in the balcony and everyone that's in the annex. I know something about you. Because it's in me, it's in all of us. Every one of us needs 
the Holy Spirit. Every one of us needs to deal with this this morning. And I ask you the question, have you been to the Holy Ghost yet said, Lord, have I been acting independently of you? Have I been just been taking things in my own hand, trying to make something happen? That's pride. That's pride. Don't try to make something happen. You'll mess it up. You pray. And every breathing moment, you don't have to go to some place and just cry. You don't have to go some place and just get on your knees. Just pray without ceasing. Driving your car, wherever it is, talk to him. Talk to the Holy Spirit. If he's here, God help us if he's not going to talk. God help us as Christians if he won't give us guidance. God help us if he won't come with strength that he's promised. Then God would be a liar and everything would, would fade. Everything would be impossible. There would be no sense to life itself. That's what faith has to come to the conclusion. If, if I can't hear from God, if I can't get my guidance when I trust him, then there's not worth, there's nothing to this life. But he's there. He's spoken to you. And he wants to heal your hurt. He wants to assure you that he knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. And in his time and his way. You see, he's not just testing you. You've already gone through the test. This is for somebody now who's speaking prophetically. God's not trying to get at anything but your confidence and trust in him. And he's waiting for you to give up. He's waiting for you to say, I surrender. I'm not going to fight this anymore. Live or die. I'm going to trust you, Jesus. Live or die. I'm going to trust you. Jesus, I pray for everyone in this congregation. I pray for the choir, the orchestra, and the pastors and and elders, and for all who hear my voice. Lord, we're all in the same condition. We're in need of you. Lord, we still battle. We battle areas in our life that we weren't ready to see or hear about. But now you're taking us deeper. And you, you want to produce this likeness of Christ so that there's a quiet confidence and people see and they can feel and they can know this man, this woman is not going to fail. This man, this woman is not going to turn their back on Christ. They're not going to backslide. They're not going to go back to their old ways because now there's a hunger planted by the Holy Ghost. There's something in this heart that says, I want to change. It doesn't say, I will change, I want to change, and God, you're the only one that can change me, because it's impossible otherwise. God, that's the desperation we call for in this service this morning. In your precious holy name, amen. Now, Lord, send your spirit and heal into the annex, into the overflow rooms, and here in the house. Bring us sweet confidence and rest. Where the heart says, yes, Lord, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to make any promises. I just have to trust and rest in your faithfulness. Will you do that right now in a quiet moment here? Will you just turn it all over to the Lord? Turn it all over to the Lord. You say, oh, but I'm so afraid. No, don't be afraid. God says, I'm with you. And I'm speaking to you. And if your heart says, I hear you, Lord, I will trust you. When you walk out here today, you'll see God move in ways that you never thought possible before. Now, some of you that have come forward were at the end of your rope. You went as far as you could go in your human strength. But in a way, that's a good place to be because then you, you know you have no place to turn but to him. But do it. If you're here... For the first time, maybe, or you've never received Christ as the Lord of your life, I'll I'll lead you in a prayer. That prayer in itself won't save you. But if your heart is open, the Holy Spirit, and if you'll ask him as we pray to come into your heart, he will start a work in you of changing your life. How many that came forward, I ask this maybe in the whole auditorium for everybody, how many 
acknowledge, you admit you need to change. Raise your hand. Just keep it there. Just keep it there. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I want you to change me. I want to be more Christ-like day by day. I want your spirit. So I ask, Holy Spirit, come now. Fill my life, my heart. Live in me. Do the work in me. Give me godly sorrow. But show me my heart as I pray. And Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, give me power and give me strength to resist the enemy and the temptations and the fears. Now, let me pray for you. Father, you see these hands that are raised in the annex and all over the place. We acknowledge before you. Without you, we can't take a step. Without you, we're going to fall flat on our face. Without you, temptation would overwhelm us. Without you, we couldn't stand another day because of the things that we face. Lord, financial problems that are overwhelming, it looks hopeless. And marriage problems, physical problems, so big so overwhelming that we don't know what to do. But, Lord, we do know now what to do. We turn to you, Holy Spirit. Purge us, sanctify us, and bring us to the heart of Jesus and bring us into the throne room of Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for the cross that brought us now into the heavens. And we rejoice now for the victory of the cross and the victory in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we're going to rest on you now. Will you pray these words with me, please? Holy Spirit, I want to trust you, but I don't even have the faith to trust you. So even that, you have to give to me. Give me faith. Jesus, forgive my unbelief. Put faith in my heart now. Will you thank him for doing it right now? Just thank him. This is the conclusion of the message.